All right, I think we should get started, right? Are we uh, ready? Okay. Yeah. All right. So welcome everybody to uh, another Comaral uh, seminar. Um, so yeah, really excited today to have Roxana Radulescu here. She's a PhD student at the iLab of the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, where she's working with uh, Anne Noe. And it's actually the same place where I started my own PhD work more than uh, 20 years ago. So it's really, really fun to see this. And uh, Roxana is currently, I believe, in the final stages of her PhD work. And I think she has been one of the pioneering researchers on the topic of multi-agent, multi-objective reinforcement learning. And it has, for me, also been really great to see that topic, you know, coming alive over the last few years. And today um, she will talk to us about decision making in these um, multi-agent, multi-objective settings. Uh, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to hand over to you, Roxana. I think Roxana is happy to take questions um, during the talk, but you can also leave them in the chat and, uh, and we will monitor. Um, Roxana, are you still there? I see uh, a frozen image, actually. Okay. <laughs> H horrible time for internet to break down. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's. Uh, I'm sure she will. She will show up again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think she's back. Yeah. I'm sorry. I I just got disconnected. No. No worries. No worries. I'll let you uh, share your screen again, and uh, then we can get started. Yeah. So with um, Franz, if you could help me monitor questions that might pop up, then we uh, we can yeah, keep absolutely. an eye on that for you, Roxana. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Okay. So I should be able to see my full screen. Yes, we can see uh, it. Hope yep. it's working. Okay, so uh, unfortunately I missed my introduction. Oh, it's such a pity, but I'm really uh, excited to be sharing with you today some uh, some of the work I've been doing uh, as part of my uh, PhD research on uh, decision making in multi-objective, uh, multi-agent settings. Um, so let's just get started. I will start with a bit of motivation perhaps on, on the topic. Uh, this is basically what you hear when people are talking about each of the individual uh, aspects that we'll discuss today, so multi-agent and multi-objective, uh, namely the fact that many problems uh, in the real world actually involve more than one agent and are also naturally characterized by multiple objectives. So you can take here, for example, uh, supply chain measurement. So um, the process of uh, optimizing information and material flow in a supply chain. And there are so many uh, stakeholders involved here. So for example, a small part of it, you would like to optimize uh, warehouse costs uh, where you are depositing your uh, products, but at the same time, you have some scale department with always, which once you do always have enough um, supply to meet the demand and so on. Or for example, traffic and driving, it's a classical multi-agent system, but it's also multi-objective. You always want to reach your destination as fast as possible in a safe manner, maybe also in an eco-friendly manner and so on. Um, now what you often see nowadays with multi-objective problems is that um, people try to cleverly engineer the multi-objective um, signal um, and scalarize it from the start in order to avoid having to deal with the multi-objective um, aspect. But I would argue that this is uh, tricky since you might be missing some uh, complex trade-offs there by doing this. Um, okay. Now, I will start by discussing a bit multi-agent RL. This is perhaps the, the most well-known uh, element by uh, each and every one of us here. The obligatory RL um, 
group here for multi object uh, for multi agents sorry you have uh, your n agents each of them are taking an action according to their um, current policies the environment executes the joint action and returns some reward and state information to each agent uh, if we are in a cooperative setting the reward function will be the same for uh, each agent now um, we have seen in the last few years uh, numerous novel learning algorithms developed for multi-agent uh, settings, especially uh, when talking about deep model. Uh, now, they can be grouped in, in uh, many categories, for example, learning to communicate, um, transfer learning, opponent modeling, uh, coordination, cooperation and competition, and so, so, so much more. So definitely there is a lot of inspiration and uh, a lot of developments from Marl to be uh, across to uh, multi-objective settings. Now, uh, when we are discussing multi-objective decision-making, the main uh, Im important aspect here is the vectorial uh, reward function where each component indicates the performance on a objective for this uh, work and for this talk i will take a utility-based perspective so um, they we assume there exists a utility function that maps our vectorial reward to a, a scalar value um, we only make one assumption about this utility uh, function namely that um, it is uh, it belongs to the class of monotonically increasing uh, it uh, functions so this means that um, if for all objectives the value under some policy pi is greater or equal than the value under policy uh, pi prime then this is also this relationship is also carried across when applying the utility function so um we usually say that this is a minimal assumption to make as it can translate uh, to um, always want more of each objective um, Moreover, in this work, I will actually discuss the case of nonlinear uh, utility function. Um, so, in single agent multi objective scenarios, we can um, split the process of solving a problem in three phases. Uh, so, we have planning or learning, the selection phase, and then uh, the execution phase. Uh, depending on the knowledge on uh, with respect to our utility function, we can further distinguish between um, three cases. So if the utility function is uh, known, we can potentially reduce the problem to a single objective by applying the scalarization function and then um, applying our algorithm, deriving one solution and uh, executing it. But most of the time we are required to apply a multi-objective uh, algorithm that returns an entire solution set. We can then apply the utility function when it becomes available or actually involve the user uh, in, uh, in the loop and ask him to select a preferred solution that will be then executed during the execution uh, phase. So in order to formalize a bit everything, yeah, we have seen this the definition of an NDP so many times, but when we go to multi-objective NDPs, again the main difference will be the sectoral reward function and what i wanted to show here is um, uh, basically the fact that the goal now will also change since now we are uh, optimizing the expected discounted sum of rewards with respect to some policy and initial uh, state distribution but this value is as well sectoral now um, so when we take a utility-based approach, we need to apply the utility function and we actually have two options. So this is again, um, at this optimization criteria were again defined already by uh, Reyes and all in their uh, multi-objective survey. So we have two options. If we are interested in um, the value over multiple applications of our policy, we will use the scalarized expected uh, returns or SCR criterion. Um, so let me give an example to understand a bit uh, what I mean here. So um, for example, 
think about the hospital trying to optimize a treatment plan and reduce uh, mortality rate for a certain disease over all the incoming patients. So, um, in this case, then you would like to use the SCR criteria. But if you are interested in a single policy application, we will have to apply the uh, expected scalar risk return or ESR criteria. So, again, an example to understand what crowns this, um, uh, this criterion. If you are a patient suffering from a certain disease, then you are interested in choosing a treatment plan that will uh, maximize the probability of a positive outcome for your particular situation. So, so the choice of uh, optimization criteria is really driven by what you are trying to, to optimize. And they were um, really explicitly meant in, uh, uh, in the literature because SET is usually the default case in planning and RL, while ESR was always just considered in game theory. Um, and we have shown that the choice of optimization criteria is important because it does lead uh, to different solutions uh, in the case of nonlinear utility functions. Maybe important to note here that if you have linear uh, utility functions, there is no distinction to be made between these two uh, criteria. Now, if we move uh, to the setting we are targeting uh, here, multi-objective, multi-agent decision-making, uh, we need to combine all the elements we have discussed so far, and everything becomes, of course, more complicated. So we have multiple agents interacting in the environment. The reward function is factorial, and each agent has a uh, yeah, potentially distinct and unknown utility function. So, uh, we present here an overview of possible uh, multi-objective, multi-agent models, starting from the most um, general one, multi-objective partial observable stochastic gains. And depending on the assumptions we make um, regarding the setting we need to solve, we can also, of course, impose certain uh, um, restrictions and transition to different models. So if we are in a fully observable situation, uh, we will be under the multi-objective stochastic game scenario. Uh, if we additionally consider a stateless setting, then we are in the multi-objective normal form uh, setting. If we add also cooperative, um, a cooperative assumption on top, we are in the multi-objective um, coordination graphs and, and so on. Um, in our survey, we actually noticed that most of the work so far has been done uh, towards the center of this diagram because, of course, transitioning towards the edges implies a um, more complex uh, problem. Um, the work I will present in the second part of the talk will actually focus on multi-objective normal form games. So I just mentioned that multi-objective, multi-agent models are typically named according to assumptions um, about observability, whether the problem is sequential or not, and the structure of the reward functions. For example, if it's cooperative, it's, if we are in a cooperative setting or not. So these are important distinctions, but they're sufficient to determine what represents a solution when we follow a, a utility-based approach. So that's why we propose a taxonomy based on both the reward as well as the utility functions. So um, we distinguish between two types of reward functions, a um, reward in which it receives the same uh, value or return vector or um, an individual reward setting in which each agent receives a different value or uh, return vector. Now, furthermore, we make a distinction in three types of um, utility, more or less orthogonal to the types of rewards. So we have team utility, uh, where all uh, agents serve the same interest. So for example, when they all work for um, the same company or um, are on the same football team, um, they have social choice. Um, when we are interested in optimizing the overall social welfare across uh, all agents. And finally, we also have the uh, individual uh, utility. Uh, when each agent just uh, serves a different agenda and optimizes with respect, uh, for that, with respect to that. Um, we also note that um, individual rewards and 
steam uh, utility setting is not realistic. That's the one that's missing over here. So even if the utility function uh, of all agents uh, is the same, it will still lead to different um, individual utilities because you have different inputs coming from uh, over here. Um, so that's why we treat this case the same as the individual reward in, uh, individual utility settings. Uh, yeah, finally, of course, we also note that um, the utility function can be applied according to the two criteria we discussed before, ESR or uh, SCR. Okay, um, another contribution we, we had for this uh, multi-objective, multi-agent survey was um, discussing what solution concepts apply to each category uh, we defined in our um, Taxonomy. So you'll see three big categories here: uh, crisis, mechanism, design, and uh, equilibrium and stability concept. So uh, I will start with coverage sets. Um, a coverage set contains basically at least one optimal policy for each possible utility function, um, and can be used, of course, in team reward, team utility setting. You can see this as um, a single agent multi-objective case. So you have the same. Um, motivation for using coverage set as a solution concept. But furthermore, in uh, team reward individual um, uh, utility scenarios, coverage sets could also be the input to some negotiation process to allow agents to, to agree upon which policy to execute. Um, or finally, in uh, individual reward individual utility settings, a um, coverage set can also be the set of all possible best responses to the behavior of the other agents. However, this might quickly become um, infeasible if the, the set of possible policies of other agents becomes too large. Of course, you can always use um, some functional approximation or uh, some way of modeling the, the possible behaviors of the other agents to make this still a viable approach. As far as I know, this, this hasn't been um, tried yet. I, I don't know, you can let me know later if I'm wrong. Um, okay, next. Uh, when we are looking for a socially desirable outcome for a multi-agent uh, decision-making problem, yeah, mechanism design is a key approach, but it's also the case in multi-objective settings. So this means that we can start taking a a system perspective and um, decide what is a socially uh, desirable outcome. I have here a small diagram for the um, individual reward, uh, individual utilities uh, setting. So the idea is to define double a social um, space function that we want to optimize. And then we need to design a system that forces agents um, to be truthful about utilities. Um, and then we need to find a solution that is optimal under this W we have uh, defined. Uh, finally, equilibrium and stability concepts, uh, well, they come in handy when the reward, um, for, for all the reward structures under individual utilities. So basically when discussing um, yeah, selfish agents uh, interacting, uh, in our in, the, in our work, we have um, discussed how to use multiple solutions concepts to multi-objective settings. But uh, I will give here um, the example of Nash equilibria uh, for, for multi-objective normal forms. So, as you know, um, a joint strategy represents a Nash uh, equilibrium if no agent can gain any additional payoff by unilaterally deviating. So. Um, in, uh, but in multi-objective settings, we still need to apply the utility function. So in case of uh, ESR, this will be done after uh, every interaction. Oops, sorry. This can be done after uh, every interaction. Um, and that's basically reducing the game to the corresponding single objective of uh, normal form game. But in the SCR case, um, we uh, scale rise over um, the expectation uh, of, uh, so we scale rise um, after taking the expected payoff over multiple interactions. 
Uh, so this is basically the big distinction here. Uh, if you are interested, of course, in more details for everything I have just uh, discussed here, uh, you can check out our um, survey. But now, um, what I would like to transition to is our um, opponent modeling uh, study in multi-objective games. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the, the framework we work here with is multi-objective normal farm games. These are not new. They, um, they have been introduced since the 50s and the main distinction from their single objective counterpart is the pictorial uh, payoff function. Of course, we continue the same uh, line as before. We still have the, the two optimization criteria and the assumption of uh, the existence of the utility function, so ESR versus SDR. Now, um, the most interesting thing to study here is actually the uh, multi-objective normal form games under the SCR criterion when we dealing with uh, nonlinear utility uh, functions, and this is exactly what I will be discussing next. Um, to this end, we have introduced a few multi-objective normal form games. So I will discuss perhaps two of them because they, they really present some interesting properties that allows us to, to show a lot of things. So for example, let us look at the uh, what we call imbalancing act game. It's a two pair, two objectives and three action uh, game. Um, so the actions are left, middle, right. And uh, the agents receive the same vectorial payoff when executing an action. So if they choose left middle, each of them will get the vectorial payoff 3, 1. Uh, the distinction here lies, of course, in their utility functions. So player 1 has the following utility function. It just takes the, uh, the sum between the squared values of the objectives, while the second player just multiplies the values of the objectives. What I want you to notice here is that uh, due to the construction of the game and the utility functions, uh, player one will always actually prefer imbalanced um, values in the, in the objectives because he will, get a, a, he will derive a higher utility in that case, while the second player will prefer balanced outcomes because due to his uh, utility function, he just derives a higher utility. Uh, and this leads us to a very interesting uh, radical consideration. We can show by, uh, we can prove by example, using this uh, multi-objective normal form game, that under SCR, Nash equilibria need not exist. So uh, intuitive uh, sketch of the proof here is simply the fact that player one will always have an incentive to deviate towards imbalanced outcomes, while player two will always have an incentive to deviate in the opposite uh, direction. The second uh, game I will discuss for today, uh, it's a, a slight modification of the imbalancing act game uh, that now allows us to have pure strategy net equilibria under SCR. Uh, more precisely, we have LL um, as a first uh, Equilibrium point, LL is preferred by player one due to his utility function. MM is the second equilibrium point. This one is preferred by player two because it gives him a higher utility. And RR is a third equilibrium point, but this one is dominated by both the other ones. So again, potentially we can observe some interesting behaviors over here. The first um, algorithm we will discuss in our opponent modeling study uh, is an actor critic based algorithm. But first, before any opponent modeling is done, um, we simply use a naive multi objective actor critic based algorithm. So um, the idea here is just to allow players to naturally learn mixed strategies. And um, the policy of every agent is just represented using a, a softmax function and uh, together with a vectorial uh, Q function. This is um, uh, a vector the size of the objective space for every action. 
For every interaction, the players will then sample an action according to their policy, observe their uh, multi-objective payoff, and then update their Q function and policy parameters. Um, everything is calculated, uh, the derivatives are calculated analytically here. Okay, so then if we want a, um, an initial very naive component modeling technique we can uh, introduce here, is just uh, via the fact that the agents can observe each other's uh, actions. So then uh, agents will just maintain uh, an observed action history over a number of its interactions, and then they, uh, they can derive basically empirical action frequencies and estimate the opponent's uh, policy. So um, additionally, the agents now uh, maintain a, a Q function over the joint action space, and the big distinction then with the this naive multi-objective actor critic um, lies in the calculation of their um, objectives function because now agents can marginalize the, the actions of their own according to estimates and uh, hopefully get a better uh, estimation of their expected return. So again, a fairly simple, straightforward opponent modeling uh, proposal over here. So let's see already some results in the two games I introduced before. So remember the imbalancing at game had no um, equilibria present. So we noticed that when we use this naive opponent modeling approach, there is not a lot of difference happening. Um, but the agents really don't seem to converge to any kind of interest. They will oscillate. Uh, however, in the second game, where Nash equilibria are present, so remember the, they were located on the main diagonal, um, we see that if no opponent modeling is performed, the agents nicely manage to uh, converge to their preferred equilibria points and actually uh, do avoid the, the dominated one. Uh, and the situation doesn't change too much when both the agents perform opponent modeling. However, it's very interesting to see that if only agent one um, uses opponent modeling techniques, he can actually shift the outcome uh, more uh, often in his favor. So remember, player one really preferred OL as an equilibrium point. Um, while the, the reverse is true when the second agent is performing opponent modeling. So then he is able to shift the, the outcome really in his favor. Uh, so more often converging to this M preferred equilibrium point. Um, so already interesting results even with this uh, naive approach upon modeling can confer benefits uh, when equilibria are present. Now I really really enjoyed this um, uh, contribution from uh, first Arendel. So it is the learning with opponent uh, learning awareness method. So the Lola multi-agent RL approach. Uh, so let's look a bit, a small recap of their OLADES implementation. The um, idea here was that the agents can estimate each other's um, parameters and then perform these internal um, rollouts, estimate the opponent's uh, objective with respect to the, their estimated parameters as well as the agents. Uh, parameters and then basically simulate uh, the um, opponent uh, update step and learn with respect to that. Uh, very interesting idea. So we wanted to, to translate this to multi-objective settings. Now, um, direct naive translation would look uh, in the following manner, but what you should notice here is that uh, the consequence of estimating the opponent's objective would be knowing his utility function because the objective is again remember the scalarized expected return and um, knowing the utility of the opponent uh, is not really possible it's not uh, public information and it's not really, um, directly uh, there is no direct way of estimating it nevertheless we still tried out 
this algorithm just to see what type of behaviors it outputs. But in order to make it feasible for general settings, we have to find a way of estimating basically the Jacobian of the uh, opponent. All right, so the, the derivative with respect to his um, parameters of his objective function. And in order to do this, we have used a Gaussian process. So this is a uh, non-parameter equation model. Um, and we, we constructed it in the following way. Basically, we built a training set uh, and then just um, train a GP to um, learn the opponent's update, a local update. So how do we do this? Well, remember the agents cannot do each other's actions and can estimate uh, each other's policies, basically. So now we allow us to keep a history of uh, estimated policies, as well as the opponent policy differences. So basically, we are reverse engineering the opponent's uh, learning steps. The assumption, important assumption we make here, is that our opponent is using some form of policy gradient update during learning. So then um, after uh, we use 50 here, so after 50 such estimations, we build a training set and each agent, if he's using the opponent learning awareness model, will train internally a GP. Um, and then can basically replace the rollout uh, loop of Lola uh, with just this uh, GP inference and then estimate the opponent local learning step and then with respect to that. Um, in order to make it clear how uh, we engineered our um, experiments here, I will present the interaction script for the agents. So at the beginning, agents will always uh, interact um, under a fixed policy, so without any updates for a, a certain number of steps. This will give them the opportunity to, to estimate each other's parameters. Um, and then update their policy. And if they have gathered enough uh, um, samples, they will also train the, the GP to um, use it in their own update step. Okay, so first uh, I wanted to show this um, full information multi-objective Lola. So again, this was a baseline. It's not really a realistic setting because agents now have access to each other's uh, both um, policy parameters and utility functions. Um, however, we do obtain very interesting results. Okay, in the game in which Ash are present, they again nicely converge to the nominated equilibria uh, points. However, when uh, in the game without any Nash, we observe a totally different type of outcome than before. So if you remember the um, payoff matrix, uh, they actually converge to some middle ground output. And I'll, a small intermezzo here, uh, I will discuss quickly correlated equilibria. Um, this is another type of solution concept introduced by Amman in 74. And uh, it's a bit different from Nash in the sense that now we are defining a correlated strategy, um, which is a probability distribution over the joint action space. And if we are able to have an external device sampling from this um, correlated strategy before every interaction and sending private signals in the form of um, perhaps action recommendations to, to agents, um, then we can discuss about this correlated equilibria. So a correlated strategy is a correlated equilibria if um, agents have no incentive to deviate from the given action recommendation. Um, why is it an interesting uh, solution concept? Well, if I take a small example, the game of chicken, uh, this is the uh, payoff metric. So this is the game in which the agents are uh, driving each other. They, have, they can either um, uh, swerve out of the way or continue driving. So we know that there are um, to pure uh, equilibria and one mixed strategy Nash with these uh, payoffs. However, if we look at the correlated equilibrium, uh, so basically we have this 
uh, joint strategy, this, uh, sorry, color correlated strategy um, from which uh, we sample, we have the potential of opening an even higher payoff. If we are able to send these signals to the agents and allow them to correlate their strategies, we have the potential of having even better uh, outcomes. Um, maybe if you're really not familiar with this uh, correlated equilibrium, an example in real life uh, would be traffic lights. So you know that if you see red as a traffic light, you will stop because with 100% uh, probability, the, the people coming from um, the other direction will see green, so they will be driving in the intersection. And why I'm mentioning correlated equilibrium because um, from another uh, study we had, we know that this outcome for this game is actually a correlated equilibrium. However, uh, the multi-objective law algorithm is able to find this outcome without having received any correlated signal. So it finds a middle ground solution that approximates uh, correlated equilibrium without extra uh, signal. So it's a very interesting behavior we have stumbled upon here. Um, now, the question is, of course, how does the um, the model, well, no, how does, do we perform when we introduce our uh, Gaussian process model? And uh, it was very nice to see that actually, even if we place the exact parameters and utility function, of our opponent with an estimate uh, using our Gaussian model, uh, the results stay uh, virtually the same. So using um, this G, we are nicely uh, able to capture the local uh, opponent learning uh, step. Uh, next, the next question that of course arises is what if we will try to use our multi-objective LOLA algorithm against an opponent that does not use a policy gradient based update. So um, if we break basically the, the assumption uh, over here. Well, to put this to the test, we have also introduced another uh, algorithm here, the multi-objective Q-learning. Uh, it's basically a one-shot vectorial version of Q-learning. Um, we use epsilon greedy action selection, but when the agents need to select their uh, optimal uh, action, what we, actually, what we are doing is allowing them to uh, derive their actual uh, optimal mixed strategy and then sample from that. How do we do this? Well, we just every action selection point agents will have to solve a non-linear optimization problem for maximizing their uh, SCR. So let's see what happens when um, uh, we play against an um, um, Can I ask a quick question, uh, Roxana? What, what, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Could you, what is PI exactly here? Ah, it's just the, the payoff. Uh, received by agent. Okay, I see. It's just very basically, but we are in a state. And the state here, the formula is because sometimes we use it also uh, trying to define a correlated equilibrium. This could be the correlation signal, but in our case, we don't have any correlation signal. So it's actually without the state as well. Okay. So it's very, very simple. Okay. Learning. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so let's see how we are doing. It was very interesting to observe that uh, when our multi-objective LOLA approach is uh, the second agent, it actually still manages to steer the Q learner towards a nice middle ground uh, outcome. So it was very, very nice to have this result. And this act happens actually when we uh, place uh, multi-objective LOLA plus the Gaussian process against any other previous method as well. So we also uh, tried the, all the combinations possible with the actor critic. Um, however, when um, in two is the uh, Q learner, it's not really able to learn. It just converges to a uniform probability distribution over X. Uh, actions. So it's really a difficult scenario, it seems, for the second agent to learn in this uh, in this game. Um, okay, so even though it was not such a difficult setting, we 
have already managed to, to show that opponent modeling can uh, significantly alter the learning dynamics uh, when we consider the ACR criterion with nonlinear utility functions. So you can, we have seen that when Nash equilibria are present, simple, even simple opponent modeling can confer agents uh, nice benefits, uh, allowing them to shift outcomes in their favor. And um, the nice surprise was our multi-objective Lula plus the Gaussian process model uh, that allow agents to converge to middle ground solutions. Um, now, there are um, numerous future directions to explore in this domain, basically. We have, uh, I feel we have just scratched uh, the surface. Um, so one can further uh, explore the link between multi-objective multi optimization criteria and solution concepts um, with non-linear utility functions in both stateless uh, and stateful settings for challenging real world applications. Of course, it will be necessary to develop methods that cons uh, consider continuous uh, or high dimensional state action spaces. So an important next step is of course to extend deep uh, RL methods to, to multi-objective multi-agent uh, settings. Uh, perhaps another important question here is can we design um, mechanisms force agents or users to be truthful about their uh, preferences and if not can we estimate their utility functions uh, see from their behaviors um, so you have seen that what we have done here is actually estimating the entire uh, learning step direction so not really the utility function um, and then in most of this work we have assumed that there is a separate um, learning or planning phase and then the policy selection phase and then the uh, execution phase well we, uh, we didn't have a policy selection it was just because uh, the utility function was done but it's also uh, possible to visit from users while planning or learning um, to elicit their preferences so to lead to this interactive combined approach um, Parallel negotiation uh, and learning or planning is also, to my knowledge, still unexplored. So this um, interactive querying approaches uh, could be very helpful in uh, mechanism design settings where individual rewards, uh, reward vectors, um, and now that the agent's uh, preferences are unknown. And now um, that we have um, well, identify different settings and solution concepts relevant for multi-objective uh, multi-agent systems. There are, of course, opportunities to um, revisit problems that initially modeled a single objective um, and cast them from a multi-objective uh, perspective. Um, before ending, of course, I would like to, to thank my wonderful collaborators. It was a pleasure to work on all this uh, together. And I welcome any questions you might have. All right. Thank you uh, so much, Roxana. So first, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, yeah, let's see. Do, do, are there people who have a question? Feel free to um, raise your hand or type it in the chat. Um, I can ask a question. Yep, yep. Uh, because also, so I, I got really, I, I also, first, thank you for, for a very nice talk. I, I got extremely intrigued about halfway, and um, I might have missed some parts afterwards. But you said at some point that uh, uh, for one of these objectives, I think SER, uh, now a normal form game might not have a Nash equilibrium. And and I got like, whoa, what's yeah. going on there? What is going on there? So so um, yeah, could you perhaps try and give the intuition a little bit? Because uh, yeah, 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 I got really like so, choking up uh, there. Yeah, I was just wondering yeah, to say. So that, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the idea there is that you are adding this extra, uh, you can call it degree of freedom once you start taking expectations basically so once you start taking expectations over multiple uh, interactions and then scalarizing them 
it really changes all the, the properties. And then you give the agents the extra freedom of deviating in expectation, of wanting to deviate in expectation, basically. So you, you can show really in, uh, we have shown by example that this is true using exactly uh, this game. So you can uh, show in all situations that no matter what you would come up with, player one will want to deviate towards uh, pure strategy uh, that outcomes imbalanced um, payoff factors, while the second one would really always want to deviate in expectation to outcomes that output balanced uh, values. This would be the intuition behind it. So it's really this extra freedom agents get in expectation to deviate. To deviate. But Okay, so 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 I, I, well, I like, like I said, I got a bit distracted, and I was thinking like, I mean, if you have a, a, a non-form game like this, um, so in principle, I can now just construct a a scalarized normal form game, right? If I take uh, yes, but uh, indeed the exp the expected payoff factors, and I now scalarize these and. Now I, I I have a new normal form game. Well, it's not that easy under SCR, basically, because you need to also take into account mixed strategies and so on. So you can't really uh, transform a norm a multi objective normal form game in its trade off single objective one, if you consider the SCR scalarizing criteria uh, SCR optimization criterion. So, so it's really so, going so, away from the from. Hmm? So I uh, yeah. So I, I guess so. Here somehow is a, a disconnect. Something that that, that I just uh, I just don't get right. So so perhaps uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. But under SCR you take the uh, uh, the, the utility the scalarization of the expected payoff vector for you know a pair of strategies right. So uh, I don't know, I've left left. Uh, so I guess, so this four comma zero already is the expected payoff vector here, right? Yes, if they would play pure strategies uh, left left, you mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and well, so I have two scalarization functions. I can just now, I guess, apply these to, to, to these entries, right? Yeah, yeah, but in this case, for example, player two would have an incentive to deviate uh, to playing right because it would give him something higher than what he gets under uh, left left. That's the, the point. Yeah, okay. Well, it's just really hard to, to, to kind of, uh, I guess, really follow this yeah. without them perhaps completely crunching the numbers. But so, okay. So, oh, 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 all right. Perhaps now I understand what you're saying. I guess you are also, you're also taking the expectation over the realizations of, of mixed strategies inside of the scalarization. Right. Yeah. So this is this is not just expectation with respect to uh, uh, somehow a random outcomes by nature, you know, somehow yeah. uh, leading to, to to different different payoffs, uh, but also yeah. due to the, the 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 randomization of the agents themselves. Yes. 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 Yeah. Exactly. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 I'm gonna have that sink in. So, so th thanks. Uh... Are there more questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Maybe to quickly follow up on um, um, on the comment of, of Franz, it also confused me a little bit. So. In the first approach, it seems to be the case that you always combine back the objectives somehow in a single one, 
right by this scalarization while here in the normal form game representation you no longer do this uh, yeah it's no longer so straightforward to just immediately scalarize the multi-objective game and see the payoff ve uh, vectors basically under SCR. You need to take expectations first, yeah, I guess. Yeah. It becomes way more, but that's the natural thing we do in reinforcement learning, basically, though. Right, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, I still had a follow-up question, but I see somebody else has raised their hand, so when I give them the opportunity to, to ask a question. Patrick, you want to? Hey, hey Carl. Uh, hey, friends. I, I just wanted to, to jump in and, and make an additional comment on that. That's um, something that Roxana didn't quite highlight uh, is that um, under, the, under the ESR setting, um, you can, as you say, friends, uh, you can apply the utility functions a priori before you actually uh, do any learning. And you can create just it's a normal, it's a standard normal form game. Nash's theory from 1951 all applies. Um, the, the interesting thing I think about the the choice of optimization criteria in the um multi-objective and multi-agent setting with the utility functions is that the choice of optimization criterion um in, in this in this work we actually found um can actually change the set of equilibria. Um so whether you are optimizing kind of for for one interaction are optimizing for um kind of the the average or expected return over many interactions um actually changes in fact how the the equilibria um fall out of it there's there's a paper we have uh, published in the knowledge engineering review last year that you might want to uh check out if if you want some of the details and i'd be happy to follow up with you after the call as well if, if you wish and uh, thanks for the talk, Roxana. Great talk. Thanks, Great. Great, thank you. Uh, so, so perhaps l l l l l let me, uh, 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 if, if there's no other questions, ask one, one further follow-up question here. So, so I see now at this point that indeed, so it's the, let's say the randomization of the mixed strategy itself that now uh, starts interfering with uh, uh, the normal payoff that, uh, Essentially, it's changing the payoff uh, now. Yeah. Um, but I could also take now this this original description and think of the normal form game uh, really in mixed strategies, right? So, so now uh, I have players with continuous action strategies, namely the mixed strategies. Um, if I do that each of these is now going to give me uh, uh, this utility and uh, this utility vector. And for each of these mixed strategies, pairs, uh, joint mixed strategies, I can uh, uh, now compute the uh, expected payoff vector, right? So, And this I can scalarize, right? So if I if I if I if I could you know somehow do this for all infinitely many mixed yeah. uh, uh, joint joint strategies, I would be good. Um, yeah. Of course, it's now an infinite set. Uh, so I guess some of so so what it, it is a compact set, so that's good. Uh, what 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 still breaks? From game theory, is it somehow the 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 the, the concave convexness which uh, which you can't show now anymore, because the scalarization function may make the payoff somehow non-concave or non-convex for the for yeah the... yeah this is what I would also think I I tried to also look back at the original proof and to see indeed what breaks the way you, you said it uh, and I think yeah that might be it basically okay okay. Indeed. All right. No, we are very good, actually. Uh, so, so I, I, I have a bit of an intuition now uh, uh, to uh, to go on. But uh, yeah, very interesting. All right, thanks. Probably just to jump in with with one last point that wasn't uh, raised already, friends, is that this only happens when the utility functions are uh, nonlinear, uh, because this distinction between the um, 
ESR and SER case is not, um, it's not there when there's a linear function. Um, and it's, it's basically because the, um, it taking the expectation inside or outside of the utility function, if it's a linear function is the same thing. And th this disappearance, if you like, of the equilibrium is, is due to, firstly, the utility functions have to be very misaligned. Um, so that this example is deliberately constructed in that way. Um, and, and then the, the actual taking the ESR versus SER um, does not lead to the same, the same numbers, essentially. Um, that's just a, another small comment. Yeah, yeah, well, so it, it seems that actually also your scalarization function may need to be quite, quite, quite wild, I suppose, uh, uh, because, uh, so when when you think of it in in, in mixed strategies, uh, so for all these these mixed strategies, which you can somehow order, essentially you have now this 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 uh, mean uh, payoff function uh, payoff vector, so that would vary smoothly, I think. So it's really about then applying this this scalarization to that mean payoff vector, and if this now somehow you know go goes in the wrong uh, direction, I guess. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, no, no, very, uh, very nice. Are there any any other questions in the meantime? Feel free to jump in or raise your hand. I think we're we don't have much time left. But one question that I still had actually was I I wasn't sure that I quite see the link with mechanism design. Can you? Sort of sketch that a little bit again. Well, um, yeah, for sure, I'm no expert in that area, but the the idea here is just that you can always take the system perspective um, and engineer that uh, social choice function and optimize with respect to it. So mechanism design still stays as an, a good option as a solution concept uh, if you are able to take this uh, system perspective and uh, optimize with respect to some uh, common uh, social welfare. Uh, if you see what I what I mean, it's just if you're you can do that, it's still viable in more objective settings. So, would you apply this in market situations then, or do you have a concrete example? Um. Oof. Not sure if you will be able to apply it in that particular case. Hmm. Maybe I, yeah, I will think about exact uh, exact okay. settings. But yeah, indeed, it would be a case in which normally agents are self interested. But you can take some top level perspective and engineer to a better social outcome. That mm -hmm. would be the the idea. Okay. Um... Is there a final question from anyone? Well, so 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 perhaps actually, uh, I, I was wondering uh, a little bit earlier in terms of the, indeed uh, the distinguishing between these uh, SER and e ESR, like in you know more practical applications, um, you know when how does this really pop up or what, 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 uh, uh, do you? Do you have an idea on, on what yeah the the uh, impact on in practice would be? And I guess also, you know, related to that, uh, I could imagine that in, in, in practical scenarios you would have actually mixes between these, right? Somehow uh, you 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 somehow mix between taking expectations and scalarizing parts of the thing. So you get this kind of perhaps expecting max type of of, of chain of, of operations, perhaps yeah that's a great observation so yeah indeed the choice of optimization criteria is really depending on what you want to optimize so what you are try, trying to solve there are multiple examples we can come up with to, to, to show this but you're right that in most real world cases it is possible to actually have agents interacting that have a mix of what they want to actually optimize and i think i think patrick's student is working on an example of this uh 
but it's completely unknown what would be the outcome in such, in such situations, basically. So you can also think about the case of work, working people commuting to, to their workplace, right? If they want to optimize over their entire uh, commute of the months, uh, and it's fine, they have some budget to optimize for it, then they apply SER. But if they have some strict meeting a certain day, they would want to be on time for sure on that day. So they, they would like, then they would like to apply ESR and so on. So it will yeah, indeed be a mixture, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess somehow, uh, yeah, that makes it also a bit hard for me to 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 kind of like. There's there's so many I guess different different types of setting that you can think about, and and in some settings uh, this seems to make more sense, and some this seems to make more sense. But yeah. you know, in the end, I'm only one person, right? So. So uh, and I, well, I'm, I'm more kind of like engineering AI guy. I'm, I'm gonna create say one AI. So what you know what what should it do or how how should it somehow combine then these these different aspects? I suppose uh, is, is I guess what. Uh, what yeah, it's a, it, it's really yeah, it's a very difficult question and it puts a lot of responsibility on the AI engineer, of course. So it would be always nice to have this human in the loop idea i would say or be careful to make the agent transparent enough or flexible enough to to represent these uh, choices basically yeah. okay All right. i think we need to wrap up here um so i would like to thank roxana again for a wonderful talk and a very very interesting new domain for me at least uh, thank you for that and um yeah i think a talk will be online soon so you can watch again if you if there was a part you want to see again and otherwise stay tuned for the next one so, thank you uh, yeah thanks everyone thanks Oksana. thank you, you.